What a great Savior you are, Lord Jesus. Thank you for the great price that you paid in our place, a price we could never pay. Lord, we, you are worthy of all praise and worship, and we offer that to you now. We long to glorify you, to glorify your Father. And your Father is glorified by this, that we bear much fruit and so prove to be your disciples. We pray, Father, that um, you would show us from your word today in Romans 6 how it is that we can bear fruit for you to be fruitful believers in Jesus Christ. Pray that you would grow us, stretch us, confront us where we need to be confronted. But most of all, in all of that, that we might become more like Jesus Christ, that we might glorify you, Father, as we bear fruit for you and for your Son in this world. And it's in his great name we pray, amen. Please take your Bibles and let's open them up to Romans chapter 6 this morning. Romans 6 is where we are at yet once again. We're going to add one more verse to what we've covered. We're going to cover verse 4. And I'm going to read the first four verses of Romans 6. You can follow along as I read. Paul says, what shall we say then? Are, are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. Signs on the freeways are so helpful as we commute from one part of our very large city to the next. Sometimes the signs broadcast something that's concerning, an amber alert for a missing child, a silver alert for a missing elderly person. And other times they broadcast helpful updates on prior freeway closures that are now wide open. Allow me to point out to you something obvious about these signs that broadcast important information the public needs to know. The signs do not cause the child or elderly person to go missing. The signs do not cause the formerly blocked freeway to suddenly clear. The signs do not effect, they do not make happen what it is they are broadcasting. That thought has never entered your mind. And if it has, come find me afterwards, we'll pray together a little bit. But this is the kind of thinking that has confused many people about water baptism. Water baptism is designed by God to simply broadcast to the public crucial information about his work of grace in the life of the one who has believed Jesus Christ for salvation and is getting baptized. Water baptism is like a public sign. It's broadcasting a reality that already exists in the believer. What the grace of God has achieved in the life of the sinner who believes Jesus Christ simply is broadcasted by that believer's baptism. The baptism does not cause the salvation. The baptism does not cause union with Christ in his death and in his burial and in his resurrection. It simply broadcasts the reality of it. And this illustration helps drop us right back into our slow but sure study of Romans chapter 6. Paul uses the believer's baptism early on in his first defense of the grace of God 
that is under attack. The grace of God that saves sinners by faith alone. What is he defending about grace? That grace in no way thinks lightly of sin. What is he defending? He's defending that grace in no way is unconcerned with sin in the believer's life, that it tolerates sin, that somehow it even benefits from sin somehow going on in the believer's life so that grace can go on even beyond it. Baptism helps make the argument that the believer who died to sin can no longer continue to live in sin like he did before the grace of God saved him. Maybe we could say it another way. To prove, to prove that grace does not encourage ongoing sin in the believer's life so that grace can increase with it, to prove that that's not the case, Paul brings up the believer's baptism into Christ Jesus. Baptism is a part of the gospel's tearing down of the slanderous accusation against grace. That grace is in partnership somehow with sin in the believer's daily living. So let's back up, let's review a little, and let's get a running start at our study, and then we'll try to advance a little bit more into Romans 6 this morning. We are talking about the gospel's first defense of grace. There are actually two. The first one is found in verses 1 to 14. The second one is found in verses 15 to 23. And the first defense of God's grace that the gospel makes is summarized in this statement. Grace in no way is in partnership with sin in the believer's life. May it never be. No way. Therefore, grace is actually against your sin, Christian. Your indwelling remaining residual sin, grace is against it, not for it, not in partnership with it. And therefore, grace's fight against sin in the believer is what we've been unpacking. First, this is all by, re- by way of review. Grace's fight against sin in the believer, number one, is a matter of death and life for me. Verse two, may it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in that sin? According to grace, believer, you died to sin, Right? This is what we've been saying. This is the heart, really, of the beginning of this defense of grace. What that death to sin means in the context of Romans 6 is that the way that you used to relate to sin has now been fundamentally, radically altered. Contextually, you are no longer a slave under sin. You, you've been changed in regards to the way you relate to sin. Grace is not for your sin, Grace is not unconcerned about your sin. It is aggressively against your sin. The ongoing presence of sin in your life. And grace's fight against your sin begins with this radically, uh, this radical changing of the way that you relate to sin. As we've said, death is a, um, a relationship changer of the most radical kind. And you experienced, by God's grace, believer, a death that has made you a different person in the presence of indwelling sin. Did you get that? You have been made by grace into a different person in the presence of indwelling sin. You are a different person in the presence of your sin's temptations, your sin's wooings, your sin's threats over you, your sin's promises over you, you are a different person in the presence of your sin's commands for you. Sin hasn't changed toward you at all. It still commands you like a master. It still threatens you like it did before. It still gives you sweet promises, and it still lies to you, and it still tempts you. It has not been defanged in that sense. But you are not the same person in the presence of that same sin. And that's where grace's fight begins, is right there. You died to sin in that way. 
So how can you still continually live in sin like you used to before you were saved? Whose thought was this? This is a ridiculous thought, Paul is saying. So grace is fight against sin. The believer, number one, is a matter of death and life for me. I'm dead to it. I can't keep living in it. Number two, grace's fight against sin in the believer requires me to investigate and know grace's achievements. Verse three, or do you not know? Verse six, knowing this. Verse nine, knowing Christ. Verse 11, consider yourselves or, or reckon or account for this. Verse 16, do you not know? Verse 19, I'm speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh, meaning, again, I'm putting the achievements that grace has accomplished for you on the bottom shelf to help you in your weakness to grasp them. The emphasis throughout the chapter is that um, it's possible to not know these things and be a Christian, and you can't not know them. You must know them. You're going to have to work to know them. You are not going to get them by simply existing. They are not going to come into your mind, and you're not going to grasp them simply by osmosis. You must investigate, and you must know these things. This is what Romans 6 is there for in many ways. So grace's fight against sin in the believer requires me to investigate and know grace's achievements. Number three, by way of review still, grace's fight against sin in the believer is rooted in my union with Christ. Just like there's um, language throughout the chapter on knowing and, and that we should not know, there's also language throughout this uh, chapter on union with Christ. Grace's fight against sin in your life, believer, it doesn't happen apart from Jesus Christ. You are not here fighting against sin by grace while Jesus is standing over there watching, coaching, praying, screaming like a dad in the stands watching his son play soccer. No, grace tells you over and over and over in this chapter that the believer is in union with Christ in this fight against sin by grace. And, and it's not a union like he's standing next to you like a personal trainer trying to get you to do three more reps. But notice this amazing union language. Look at verse three. You've been baptized into Christ Jesus. and You have been baptized into his death. We have been buried with him, buried with him, raised from the dead, even similarly. Verse five, you become united with him in the likeness of his death, also in the likeness of his resurrection. Verse six, our old self was crucified with him. That's very dramatic union language. Verse eight, we have died with Christ. We also shall live with him. This union language puts Christ crucified, Christ buried, Christ raised from the dead at the forefront with grace in your mind as you contemplate grace's achievements in you and for you in your fight against sin. Grace's fight against sin in the believer, number three, is rooted in my union with Christ. Fourthly, grace's fight against sin in the believer broadcasts my changed relationship to sin through my baptism, verses three and four. And here is where we're, our opening illustration about what signs broadcast and what they do not cause comes back into play. Paul's answer for the reason why the one who died to sin still can't continue to live in that sin centers on what the believer publicly broadcasted through his water baptism. The proof offered for how one who died to sin cannot still keep on living in sin is this. Don't you know what you broadcasted to your community through your baptism? Don't you know? No one believes that public signs cause the reality they broadcast to happen. As we said, amber or silver alerts on signs do not cause anyone to go missing. And this obvious fact about signs, it illustrates what God's design is in water baptism for the believer. It broadcasts. 
A believer's being plunged under the water and then coming up out of the water publicly broadcasts crucial information about the one baptized. But information that has already occurred, a reality that has already occurred. Baptism in water does not cause the reality for the believer any more than a sign alerting you to a hairpin turn ahead actually causes the road to bend. So let's review what we covered last week and then we'll add a little bit more with verse four. So by way of review here in this point, water baptism in the New Testament, you remember, was, is, was a very very public event. The community gathered at the source of water. They came down to the river there to rest, to cool themselves, to, to wash whatever was dirty, to water their livestock. Everybody would have been there in the heat of the day in the Mediterranean world. Being baptized there would be maybe akin to like what we said last week about like maybe being baptized in the lobby of a Starbucks at 7 a.m. in the morning, rush hour. Everybody's there. Baptism for the believer in Jesus Christ broadcasts crucial information about a reality that has already occurred. So going all the way under the water uh, broadcasts something. Coming all the way out of the water broadcasts something. Uttering the name of Jesus Christ in all of that broadcasts a crucial reality that the public, the public must take in regarding the believer in Jesus Christ. And water baptism in the New Testament had Little to no delay between the time a sinner believed Christ or repented towards Christ and when they were actually down in the water getting baptized. You see something of this in Acts chapter 8 when the Ethiopian eunuch is traveling back from Jerusalem and he's got his whole entourage with him and he's reading from the scroll of Isaiah in his, in his chariot. Acts 8 shows how ready and how prepared the Ethiopian eunuch was to be baptized. He said in verse 36, look, water, what prevents me from broadcasting right now what is true? And the chariot stopped and Philip got out of the, with the eunuch, went down in the water and he was baptized. Peter's call to repentance at the end of his sermon on the day of Pentecost, it reflects the same immediacy. When the people were brought to conviction concerning the fact that they just killed their Messiah, they cried out, brethren, what shall we do? And Peter put two things together with almost no space between them. Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. In other words, the very first expression of repentance toward Jesus Christ was to be a very public expression of that repentance, a broadcasting being baptized. The baptism in no way causes the repentance nor the forgiveness of sin that comes with it. But baptism would broadcast the repentance and it would broadcast the forgiveness of sin. So grace states the fact that it achieved the believer's death to sin in verse two. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? We died to sin. It states that when, the, when grace saved the sinner through faith alone. First of all, just notice that God wants that publicly broadcasted. It's not a private matter in his mind. And how did God want that death to sin communicated? One of the very first communications of the believer's death to sin was to be when the believer went under the water and came out of the water in public baptism. That broadcasted a changed relationship to sin. But the believer's baptism into Christ, verse 3, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? That provides crucial information about the believer's death to sin. You see, it was the believer's union with Christ in his death at the cross. In other words, Jesus wasn't nearby watching the believer go through his own death to sin, but rather, somehow, by the mystery of grace, by the, by the power of grace, Jesus' death at the cross was the death the believer died when the believer died to sin. Baptism is the broadcast of that death. It is not the cause of that death. 
And this is the complement then to what grace spelled out for us in Romans chapter 5. You remember, prior to being saved by grace, believer, you were enslaved to your own sin, and you were also inseparably united to the rest of sinful humanity in Adam, according to Romans 5, verse 12 and following. You were completely unable to do anything of yourself to separate yourself from that slab of sinful humanity. You were like one rock among a billion others cemented together in a sinful slab of humanity. You were in sinful solidarity with Adam and everyone else. So for God to save you out of that sinful slab of solidarity that seized you, God's grace had to not just overcome or abound over your own personal sin. But the argument in Romans 5 is that God's grace had to actually jackhammer you out of that sinful slab of humanity too. And it did. Grace had to abound there also where sin was corporately abounding in us all. And that's the amazing, glorious message of Romans 5 concerning salvation by grace alone through faith alone in Christ alone. And what Romans 6 now tells us is that in That salvation by grace, you believer, first of all, died to sin. By grace's achievement through that death, which is Christ's death and your union with him in that death, grace tells you in Romans 6 that your relationship to sin is different now, that you're not the same person towards sin you used to be. Romans 6 now tells us also that in that salvation by grace, believer, you were also separated away. You were broken free. You were jackhammered out of your formal sinful solidarity with all of the rest of lost humanity with the result that you are now by grace in solidarity with Jesus. Not Adam, Jesus. And you're in solidarity with a new people that are his people each of you united together in your union with Christ in his death, and that new people is locatable in every church that believes and conducts itself by this gospel in Romans and in the New Testament. God's intent is that the general, unsaved public that you used to be one with, believer, His his desire is that they now receive a broadcasted message from you through your public water baptism that you belong to Jesus. You are baptized into him. That you died to your own sin in your death with Christ. You were baptized into his death. You were buried with him. And that you are no longer a part of all the rest of them in their solidarity and sin. And that you are now identifying with this new people, the church. Going under the water illustrates what grace has already achieved in you, believer. But is now eager to broadcast to everybody. You died to sin with Christ in his death, and everyone must know this. Listen, we do not have a private, keep-it-to-yourself faith. I've told you this before. When I first became a believer, I met a a guy, or I reconnected with a guy from high school that I went with who was a a year or two older than me, and he told me when he heard that I became a Christian that, that he was a Christian. And I was like, what? I used to go to high school with you. He goes, but I'm kind of one of those undercover Christians. That's not the case. Your baptism makes it a very public matter what the grace of God has achieved for you. So again, Romans 6 tells us that going under the water and then coming out of the water, it illustrates what grace already achieved but is now eager to broadcast. As a believer, you are now an entirely different person in the presence of your sin compared to what you used to be back then under the power of your sin.
your union with Christ and his death, it fundamentally, radically altered your relationship to sin. Grace's fight against your sin from the beginning, from the beginning, it makes a public broadcast that you are no longer with the rest in their slavery to sin, but instead you are with Christ's people in their fight against their indwelling sin. How ludicrous to think that if grace did this, that you would just go on in your sin like you used to. Here's the simple summary. What grace has already achieved in you, grace is eager to broadcast through baptism. But Paul and the gospel say more about this. Let's look at verse four. Therefore, the natural outflow from verse three is stated. We have been buried with him through baptism into death. Our union with Christ is now just, did you see it? It was taken another step beyond what it just described. From death to burial. To be buried, to be entombed, that puts an officialness on death. Burial is something of a seal of certification, a seal of validity, where a valid, genuine death exists Entombment or burial is appropriate, must follow. Jesus' death was a real death at the cross. And the officialness of that death was certified by and in his burial in the tomb. Here's what's being said for you, believer. Your union with Christ in his death was therefore also a real death with Christ. And grace, which is against your sin and not for it, is telling you how official your death was, how valid your death to sin was with Christ. You were entombed with Christ in your death to sin. When they rolled the stone in front of Jesus' tomb, everyone knew he was dead. His disciples knew he was dead. His mother knew he was dead. His enemies knew he was dead. Three days dead. That's how official, that's how real, that's how valid your death to sin is. And your baptism broadcasts this officialness. Why? Why? Why does grace state your death in such official, undeniable terms? Verse 4, so that as Christ was raised from the dead, dot, 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 so we too might walk in newness of life. You see, a comparison flows out of that undeniable, official, valid, genuine death and burial we experience regarding sin. And this is the path. This is the path that God has chosen for us so that newness of life could be ours. It was this journey into a place Humans know life does not exist. A journey into that place, a tomb, that's where newness of life will come. Think on how counterintuitive that is. If you were going to lead someone to a better quality life that they never knew before, you probably wouldn't think to lead them into a tomb to get them there. But that place of official death to sin means what? (laughs) That only one person can bring life from there. And that's the point. God took you into a place, believer, in your union with Christ where only he could be the provider of life. There's no other options in the tomb where you're dead. God alone is the one who can make newness of life come from that lifeless location. The grave is a dead end. Like every man who carried his own cross never went back home later that day, so the man who dies and enters his tomb never walks another step of life again. We just can't make life happen from the tomb. We can't. You can't make a better life come from there. 
the only one who can bring you out of the tomb into newness of life is the same one, the only one who could unite you to Christ crucified and unite you to Christ buried, God. The only way to separate you from the sinful life you lived in sinful solidarity with the rest of humanity was for God to unite you to his son, unite you to his son's death, and then take you into his son's tomb, and then bring you out with Christ in his resurrection. So that you might walk, verse 4, or live or conduct yourself in newness of life. A life meaning very much, a life very much not like your old life at all. And this must be broadcast as well through your water baptism. You've noticed in water baptism here that every single person who goes down into the water actually comes out of the water, right? And so remember, verse 4 states a similarity. As Christ was raised, so we too... So let's examine what this verse says about Christ being raised from the dead. Look what it says in verse 4. Do you see it? Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father. Remember, the glory of God is, is not God. It's not his triune being, but it is his display or his communication of himself, his overwhelmingness. God's glory is a display of his weightiness or his impressiveness as God. And in scripture, it's almost always tied to radiant, brilliant light. So Christ was entombed in and under the oppressive weight of death. No man can get out from under the domination of death like that. But that is where the impressiveness of God showed up. That is where the glory of God, the glory of the Father showed up. Christ was raised from the dead in that tomb through the overwhelming, weighty, impressive, radiant, and brilliant splendor and majesty of God the Father. In our minds, glory and a grave, they don't appear to go together. But God the Father's glory was very interested in God the Son's grave because what was going to happen there in that tomb of death through the glory of the Father was a resurrection to life never before seen or experienced by anyone. And you say, yeah, but what about Lazarus? He was raised to the old same life and he died. Not Jesus. He is the first fruits among many. He was raised to a newness of life, resurrection life, never before experienced by anyone. The Father put his own glory on the line at the grave of his son, and that resurrection from the dead is what your newness of life in Christ is similar to. So that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might live in a newness of life. That means the newness of life that you experience, believer, today is as shocking and unheard of and as never before experienced as Christ's resurrection was. This is a newness of life that is not the result of you tinkering with your old life. And refurbishing it. It is a newness of life that could only come from the God of glory who put his glory on the line in the grave of his son. If you are going to have a fighting chance by grace against your remaining sin, this is the only kind of life in which to do it, from which to do it. What you are experiencing in life as a believer right now is not sort of, kind of reflective of the old life that you once had without Christ. This life is an 
unheard of life. It is an unexperienced life you never imagined before. This is newness of life in that sense. Line this newness of life up next to the old life you lived under sin in that sinful slab of humanity, and the only conclusion you will come to is that to explain this newness is God did it. God did it. God did it. And this is what God demands of grace. This is what God sent his grace to go do in your life, in your salvation. The only way grace could make you new and ready and equipped to fight against remaining sinful corruption in your life was to do it this way, this way. what you were, what you were under your sin. Believer, what you were toward your sin without Christ, it, it, had, to, it had to die. Nothing of the way that you related to your sin before could remain. Nothing of the way you related with all of your former sinful comrades could remain. A new you had to come forth so that you, in that newness of life, could fight against remaining sin in your life. And God's means for grace to achieve that was to unite you with Christ specifically to unite you with Christ crucified, Christ officially buried, Christ raised from the dead. That not only radically changed the way you relate to your sin, believer, but it also stepped you out to walk in a newness of life never before imagined or experienced by you. What you are experiencing now is nothing of any kind of life or style of living you once had before. And the point in verses three and four that grace is making regarding its fight against your sin is this. Your baptism broadcasts all of that. All of it. How could anyone come to the conclusion that grace is content for sin to continue on in your life so that maybe grace can also increase? If that were the case, what a massive, hypocritical first statement grace has you make. If, if grace was truly in partnership with sin somehow in your life, but had you very early on broadcast this kind of a radical relation change to sin, it makes no sense. It is a contradiction of the greatest evil. What a slanderous thought about the grace of God that saves sinners. So grace's fight against sin in the believer, number four, broadcasts my changed relationship to sin through my baptism. So you, you, under, you have to understand this. Grace's fight against sin in your life, it gets put out there very plainly in the public eye at the very beginning of your new life in Christ through your baptism. God, God's grace just wants it all out on the table. You're not with those people anymore. You're in Christ and you're with this new people and all of these people have a radically different relationship toward their sin that they never had before. If you know this morning that that's not you yet, if you know this morning that, that you are not under that saving influence of God's grace in Jesus Christ, I want you to listen carefully. It's true that believing Christ to save you will mean saving you from God's wrath in hell. That is a glorious, precious thing 
reality that the gospel proclaims. But you must also know that God's saving grace means what you have been towards sin and what you have been under sin must and will change dramatically. You can't remain as you have been in sin. And the gospel won't divide these two realities from each other. Many have tried to separate these two things, you know, that you can be saved and not go to hell, but you really don't have to change very much. Nothing could be further from the truth. Grace doesn't operate that way. And just to be clear again, grace doesn't demand you change yourself first and then it will think about being active in your life. That's not grace. Rather, in salvation, you just kind of lie there, sin sick under the weight of your sin disease and believe Jesus Christ. You believe his death to be sufficient for you, to save you. Think of it this way. Jesus never asked a leper to stop being a leper before he came to him or to try to restrict his leprosy a bit. If you could show me that you'll just restrict your leprosy, that it's really bad and you understand that, and if you'll just try on your own to restrict your leprosy, I'll I'll take some steps towards you. Never. Did that ever happen? The leprosy remained even to the point that Jesus touched the leper. But then what? Everything changed. Everything changed. And grace is similar. It comes to you in all of your leprosy, in all of your sin, and it says, don't even try to restrict your sinfulness. You cannot make yourself acceptable to God. You cannot distinguish yourself from the rest. Grace says, believe Jesus Christ even though you are currently ungodly. And God justifies the ungodly, Romans 4, 5. He justifies the ungodly. He doesn't justify the reforming. He justifies the ungodly. And what Romans 6 is communicating is that then, when you are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone, everything changes by that grace. That's what Romans 6 is communicating. Grace has no interest in you resembling what you once were under sin. Grace is against your sin on every front. And you must also be against your sin on every front under the reign of grace in your life. This is what it means to be a Christian. Are you one? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we think about um, what you have done to save sinners and what you have done to position us and make us ready to live a, a new life, in your son, we would have never come up with these kinds of things. And it makes a mockery of man's inventions of how man can save himself through good deeds and self-reform. What a sham our own efforts are. And how powerful and even mysterious your saving grace is, except it's not so mysterious because Romans 6 is unveiling it.
pray, Lord, that we would, first of all, be a people who know the achievements of grace in our lives. But yet again, Lord, what we desire is that we not just know them, we've got them filed away someplace in our minds, but what we desire is that we would entrust ourselves to you, the God of grace who achieved this. Our fight against sin is is not a walk in the park. And we must fully cast everything that we know of ourselves on everything that we know of you and your grace. Oh, let us see how broader and deeper and formidable your grace is that we might have more room in our trusting of you to bear fruit in the way that we live and glorify your name. Thank you for what you have achieved for us. What a great God and Savior you are. We worship you. We do it in Christ's name. Amen.